the Troubles. How did British and Irish views and reactions to the Troubles change throughout the mid to second half of the 20th century? The Troubles represent the tension that exploded into mass protests and violent conflicts in Northern Ireland between those who supported British rule, the Unionist, and those who desired a united republic, the Nationalist. The Troubles grew out of the context of religious tensions between Catholic minority and the British Protestant majority in Northern Ireland, along with a declining Northern economy. The origins of discontent between the Irish people and the English goes back to one of the first interactions between them, the Anglo-Norman invasion in the 12th century. This invasion established the British authority in Ireland that would last for centuries, and would be challenged in the late 20th century by Irish nationalists in Northern Ireland. By that time, another factor divided Ireland from England, religion. Ireland was a majority Catholic country, and England was a majority Protestant one, but with Protestant English control in Northern Ireland, the mixing of the two devout religious groups caused problems. Religious views spilled into politics and business, which led to discrimination and hatred against the Catholics. In 1916, Irish Republicans changed the course of Ireland's history with the Easter Rising, a mass protest against British rule and establishing an Irish Republic independent of Great Britain. Days before this, Republican leaders wrote that Easter Rising proclamation, which announced the transitional government from monarchical control to independent Republican-controlled Ireland. Although this new republic was dismantled after a week by British soldiers, the idea remained. In two years, the Irish Republican Party, Sinn Féin, rallied massive support and one year later formed a breakaway government, a new Irish Republic. After establishing the new Irish nation, war broke out between the Irish Republican Army and British forces such as the British Army and the Royal Irish Constabulary. After two and a half years of guerrilla warfare, the British government passed the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which ended the fighting and founded the Irish Free State. This also partitioned the Republic of South Ireland from the British-controlled Northern Ireland. The Southern Republic made up most of Ireland, with exception to the Northeast, the part of Ireland closest to England and the region with the majority Protestant population. As time went on in Northern Ireland, tensions between Catholics and Protestants grew. In the years between 1920 to 1922, 636 people were killed in Northern Ireland, the majority being Catholics in Belfast. This violence caused mass migrations of Catholics from the north to go south, while Protestants living in the Irish Republic migrated north. Gerrymandering became a useful tool for the Unionist government to control election outcomes. They would divide wards to ensure the majority of the population were Protestant Unionist, always keeping a slight majority overall. The economy of Northern Ireland also led to the breakout of the Troubles, as violence and tensions made big business people and executives reluctant to establish branches and workplaces in Northern Ireland. Also, it was common for Catholics to be discriminated against when looking to be hired, and Protestants were often given better op opportunities and positions than their Catholic counterparts. The lack of economic support for Catholics may have led to them to support nationalist groups promising a better future and perhaps even more violent groups like the IRA. The mix of religious disputes with economic decline ultimately led to the Troubles and also sustained the conflict over many years. This is the thesis. As Britain and Ireland underwent the ethno-nationalist conflict known as the Troubles in the mid to late 20th century, their views on the violence and turmoil underwent slight change. With this said, the ultimate outcome was that the tensions between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland remained constant, both politically and religiously. The only resolution was the Good Friday Agreement, which promised a united Ireland if voted upon by the majority. The Beginning That the city had, it plunged the city into grief. And I think after the grief, there was 
enormous anger. I think it set the provisional IRA really up in business. They must have had an enormous number of recruits after that. I'm sure they had. It put the British Army in a situation where, however unacceptable it might have been before that, they've never ever recovered from that. As Bishop of Derry, do you regard the provisional IRA as being members of your flock? Some of them, I suppose, are, yes. Um, I think every church has got its sheep who stray. Uh, every church has. I know some of the people involved. I know many of those in prison. I'm also familiar with what has shaped them the way they are. I know, and indeed I share, in many cases, their feelings of frustration. I disagree fundamentally with the methods that they use to achieve their objectives. Aren't you wasting your time trying to convince the erring members of your flock in the provisional IRA of the error of their ways? No, uh, I'm a follower of Christ, who said to go after the one that was lost. Uh, and I think I would be untrue to my calling if I abandoned them or further even excommunicated them. I feel that communication is much more important than excommunication. Can the IRA be defeated? Militarily, no, I don't think so. I don't think you could ever defeat a guerrilla army militarily. I haven't heard of one being defeated totally. When do you defeat them? When the last one is locked up in prison or killed? As soon as he is locked up and killed, his brothers will be involved, friends will be involved. You never get to a last one because it, the last one that you uh, put away generates actually more. It's a self-generating situation. No, I think it's a war much more of minds, I think, than bombs and bullets. And this is why I think that the churches have a part to play in this. Do you favour the withdrawal of British troops? Certainly, I, I feel that some withdrawal um, phased withdrawal uh, should be thought about and, and, and considered. Would not that withdrawal be a victory for the provisionals? Well, I don't think you can look at things in, in that way, really. Um, That's how they would see it. Yes, that might be how they would see it. But uh, the thing about this, I'm looking uh, for a society here in which people can live and live in peace with one another. And whether that should be a victory for the British Army or the Provisionals or for anybody else, uh, it doesn't worry me. I'm interested in the people of this city, Catholic, Protestant, together, getting down to make this city a city that can live with itself and can develop and can prosper. And um, I, I don't look at it in terms of victory. I think that this is one of the problems. We're all looking for victories. And um, uh, in fact, everyone is a loser in this situation. Document One is a video from 1977 where Father Edward, in the daily interview, talks about the violence that's going on in Northern Ireland. This interview, which takes place a good eight years into the Troubles, addresses the fact that hundreds have been killed and yet the problem isn't resolved. This Catholic priest, who on the basis of religion should be on the IRA's side, still questions their methods. We begin to see a progression of civilians on both sides of the war condemning the violence that is taking place in the streets. Document 2 shows an image of a dead victim's bloodstains on the pavement near the Roseville Flats in Londonderry following the Bloody Sunday killings on January 30, 1972. Perhaps the most tragic incident of the Troubles, the Bloody Sunday killings saw the deaths of 13 unarmed civilians shot at by British Army paratroopers during a protest of the policy of internment of suspected Irish nationalists. This is Document 3. It was the lake that brought home the fact that riots were no longer duotone images on television, but real and in our town too. The Troubles came in the night, acoustically, Police messages would interrupt the TV programs and my father would disappear in response to the instruction that key holders would return to their premises to check for bombs. There's the rub. We needed to feel safe and every time something happened, my father left or so it seemed. Men disappeared. Women minded children. 
Children minded their own business and learned to say nothing, hear nothing, know nothing, and to be good. At this gruntlement between the two communities before things were escalated, people's whole livelihood were flipped upside down. People were living through a war. Police messages would pop up on the television. And fathers would have to run around to look for bombs planted in their house. When the troubles started, people believed in the idea that would grant them one united nation. But now the men had to weep to keep the family safe, and women had to watch closely over their children. This is a great change from the initial stance from the Irish people that it was a worth cause that they would be willing to take. But in this document, she mentions how there is a need to be safe. As you can see in this image, the innocent ignorance in these children can be plainly seen as there is an army man sitting right behind them with a rifle, but they stand there eating the rice cream. On the left side, the image depicts a Catholic child idolizing an IRA soldier, whereas on the right there is a Protestant child looking through the scope of a British soldier's rifle. Even with the stark contrast between people's views and how these children had to grow up in the war, they still had the childlike wonder, curiosity, and livelihood that they might normally have. But instead of admiring toy trucks, they admired soldiers and guns. This is Document 4. The British government has sent troops into Northern Ireland in what it says is a limited operation to restore law and order. It follows three days and two nights of violence in the mainly Catholic bogside area of Londonderry. Trouble has also erupted in Belfast and other towns across Northern Ireland. The Royal Ulster Constabulary were forced to use tear gas for the first time in their history to try and bring the rioting under control. But tensions mounted with the mobilism of the B Specials. The Special Constables, who are armed and mostly part-time, were supposed to help the RUC restore order, but they are regarded with deep suspicion by the Roman Catholics. On the streets of Belfast, the appearance of the B Specials led to an escalation in the violence, while the Special Constables reportedly stood by and watched. Document 4 suggests that the increasing violence caused by the British people changed people's views on the matter. The BBC says that for the first time in their history, they used tear gas on the Irish people. This excessive use of force helped change the views of the Irish people and even people in Britain. The British also used special forces, which the BBC themselves said led to an escalation in violence. In these next few slides, you will be able to see the progression of military use for and against Ireland. In this image, British troops are standing in the streets at the end of a battle in Derry, where buildings are broken and burning. Here, you see the people in the doorway are terrified of the British troops, and this is a stark change to the previous feeling that people had of pride and the want for unity. This just shows that as time went on, the feelings that people had for the situation almost completely flipped as both sides used more and more violence. Here, you can see people throwing stones at British soldiers in a vehicle driving towards them. This also shows the change from peaceful protesting that they had before to the anger and violence they have adopted towards the British. Eventually, the, the violence escalated so much that the IRA retaliated outside of Ireland and blew up a truck bomb in London's financial district, which had lots of people going through and was not a small deal. This is another photo of the actual crater that the bomb blew up, and you can see just how powerful it had to be to make this crater that looks to be at least 20 feet deep. If you asked anyone at the beginning of the troubles if they thought it would escalate to this, no one would think it would become what a drastic amount of change it had from the initial idea to make a 20 foot crater in the middle of London. The Continuity Document 5 is an image taken from February 25th, 2006, a series of riots in Dublin broke out and were precipitated by a controversial proposed march down O'Connell Street of a Unionist demonstration. The disturbances began when members of the Garda Sintiana attempted to disperse a group of counter-demonstrators blocking the route of the proposed march. The situation escalates as local youths join forces with the counter-demonstrators, lighting cars on fire, breaking property, breaking stores, and throwing bricks at police. Document 6 is a map showing the distribution of Protestants in Ireland from 1861 and then again in 1991.
we don't see much of a change as the majority of Protestants are located in the Ulster area, more specifically Northern Ireland. If anything, Protestants locate there more so, which shows that there is a continuity between the mass distribution of Protestants in Northern Ireland and the lack of them in the Irish Republic. Document 7 shows a progression of graffiti on the side of a construction site. The first shows IRA Defeated Army 2019. This image is actually the second after the first one said IRA Undefeated Army 2019. The second instance, which is shown on the top, shows IRA are done defeated army. This is a backlash at the IRA saying that they've been defeated. The bottom image is after this one that says the new IRA aren't done undefeated army 2019 and then there's more IRA propaganda on the right side. This, taken in 2019, shows that there are still many tensions between the Northern Irelanders and the people from the Republic of Ireland also known as the Catholics and the Protestants. These tensions still live to this day with violence being demonstrated weekly of different people attacking each other due to these differences. This video shows how civilians feel about the IRA attacks and the troubles many years later, showing the different locations and how it affected them and their lives. When you take on a rotten, corrupt, immovable system, there is going to be violence. Thousands and thousands of people have murdered, killed, and many more injured. I mean, what for? You know, some say it was about United Ireland. Here, we're still sitting in 2019. There ain't no United Ireland, nor can I foresee anyone in the future. A United Ireland, an armed struggle, was fantasy to us back then. And it was only as things deteriorated that that's how the conflict broke out. And in that armed struggle itself, Nobody could have believed that it would have gone on for 25, 30 years. Looking back and seeing what it did to the families and the community, I have to question myself whether I believe that violence is a good method of reform, you know? I was living a different kind of life. I had a Protestant girlfriend, you know? <laughs> I, you know, I was, I was living my own revolution. It was, the, it was the ordinary sexual revolution of the 60s, you know? I had my own priorities, you know? And what I felt was destroyed in August 69 was, was the prospect of me living that normal life. So you will carry on? I will carry on, yes, to the end. And I hope the end is the end of unionism. Thank you.